thank you all for being here. Um, I'm glad to know uh, a number of you now, and uh, some of you met here for the first time. Um, Gary Moon is, uh, I am proud to say, my friend. Oh. And we've known each other since about 2012. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And I remember the first time we met, it was at Westmont, mm -hmm. and my wife was doing the Renovar Institute, um, which yeah. Gary was one of the people that set up um, this school and uh, directed it for a while. And I came at the end, and uh, it was a, it was a it was kind of a tough week for uh, the the institute, and I knew he was tired and, and all of that. And I said, let's just let's have some Quaker style prayer, and yeah. we just sort of sat there in silence for yeah. a couple minutes, and uh, that was that was the beginning of our working together. <laughs> um, yeah, Gary is a psychologist by training and has even been a Presbyterian at one point in his life, yeah. um, a, an ordained Presbyterian. And uh, he has worked at uh, various schools and uh, Westmont, uh, most recently where he's been the director of the Dallas Willard Center and now heads a branch of that, Conversatio Divina, which is certainly a website, if you don't know about it, conversatio.org, but is uh, a bunch of other things as well. Maybe we'll get into some of those. A website that would not exist without you, but yes. Yes, I was also involved in getting the website started, um, but uh, I know we've all had a fairly long day, lots of input, so we'll just kind of keep this kind of simple and light and hopefully get through our questions as quickly as possible so that uh, you guys can have a chance to ask some questions. Sounds good. Yeah. I All think right. I should ask you the first question. You get question. the first one. But I also want to say uh, thank you to Ann. Thank you for oh, hosting yeah. this. It's just wonderful. Thank you um, for coming. And um, I, Mike, I don't thank you enough publicly, but I'm completely, so what you did, I don't know of anybody that's invested more time in understanding Dallas Willard than you have. You have an incredible intellect to hold on to those thousands of tapes that you've listened to. Your book is a gift, and um, and the, the biography nor the website would have happened without you, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So with all those nice things, here's a hard question. Uh, so you, you titled this gathering, Dallas I Willard, did titled it, yeah. as a prophet in post-Christendom. What do you mean by that? <laughs> um, yeah, so Dallas, is often thought of as like a spirituality guru, right? He's he's the spiritual formation guy, and and I think we don't quite see enough of this sort of social analysis that Dallas did. Um, if you look at the five main books that he put out, and you just look at the read the first chapters, like mm -hmm. just one after another, and every single one of them. He's going to identify something that's happening either in society or in churches and, and name that and then say, okay, we need to think about this differently. And that's just, that's the work of a prophet. Yeah. Um, and once he was asked, what do you think your spiritual gift is? Now, you, you guys already know the answer because it's going to come out here. But <laughs> I wonder if that was what you would have guessed. Um, I would have guessed that he would have said teacher, mm -hmm. but he thought that his main spiritual gift was uh, prophecy. And I, I don't think he meant words of knowledge. I think he, he meant sort of the ability to see what's going on can, in the I world. I see where this is heading. And can, in the church. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and then just in our time, this sort of post-Christendom, a time when since the 60s, the church is no longer the cultural authority and uh, is just marginalized. Um, and he, he's the one that's sort of trying to help us think about what does it mean to follow Jesus now? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, so, Gary, uh, the psychologist, what'd you get a... You got a PhD in psychology. I did, yeah. yeah. I'm a recovering psychologist. A recovering psychologist. <laughs> um, well, why a why pick a philosopher or a theologian to kind of latch on to? I mean, 
Yeah. Can't you read more Freud or? <laughs> um, <laughs> that, um, now something happened, it was the same weekend. I went through Fuller, six years, uh, PhD clinical psych and then did in theology and it was wonderful. And uh, one of my classmates the whole six years was, was John Ortberg. Uh -huh. oh, and wow. I, don't, I don't mention that to drop names because I cannot tell you the number of times that Mother Teresa and Billy Graham said I do that too much. Um, wait, that's supposed to be, that was some of the humor that I was going for. Right. Uh, but, so, but the same weekend, the same weekend, two different friends, I'm living in Georgia at the time, and John is living, I think, in Simi Valley, and they give us a copy of uh, Spirit of the Disciplines. We both, having been through Fuller, a wonderful program, two years in the rear view mirror, we read that book and we had the same thought. Where was this? This is why I drove across the country to learn this, have this level of ins integrative insight into the person. Hmm. So, and then the other simple thing is, uh, Dallas's psychology book, if you will, Renovation of the Heart, he, I deeply appreciated that he didn't leave out the most important parts of the person, the parts you can't see or measure, hmm. like soul and spirit and mind and consciousness and so forth. Yeah, I take it psychologists tend to leave those out these with, days. With, with modern psychology, yes. If you can't see it, you can't measure it, it probably doesn't exist. So yeah, he, 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 it was very healing for those who were psychologists that wanted to also deal with the, yeah. those aspects of the person. Yeah. Good. I have a question for you. What do you know? Um, well, I know it's more about what you know. Um, so, we've talked about, you've talked about Dallas's prophetic voice. What do you, how would you unpack the message, the key prophetic message he's trying to give society, the church? Yeah. Um, I I think it's something like it really matters who you are and God really cares about that. <laughs> something in that direction um, that uh, and, and we've we've been through uh, decades, maybe some centuries of, of church experience where that wasn't really well hmm. known. It really matters who you are, who you're becoming, and, uh, and God really what God cares gets out of your life is the person that you become. There you go. You can quote it better than me. That, yeah. That's in the end, uh, that's like a, an epitaph or something in the mm -hmm. biography, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. And in yeah. a sense, that's... Yeah. That's the theme that the biography is written out of, sort of this becoming Dallas Willard. That's the Yeah. That's and, the I idea. mean and, and oddly, it's this incredible view of the person. I mean this I mean it, it's beyond I mean I mean I don't, don't mean anything by this beyond what I'm about to say, but it's beyond humanism. It's like it's like mm -hmm. taking it to if you really knew what yeah. the potential is, what you know, what you'll be doing in a thousand years and who you are and uh, yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This is remarkable. And I think that's that's what I I got as a very young person. I Dallas came to my school, Wheaton College. He came as a just a rig chapel speaker, and uh, and I had already read a book of his. But um, that that idea of this this life is is just the beginning. This is this is just the beginning, and mm -hmm. so you have a very long long journey ahead of you of, uh, of becoming the person that God created you to be. Yeah. I'm yeah. struggling with you saying when you were a young person, so you think there have been moments in your life where you haven't been a young person? Well, <laughs> Never mind. I, I can't going. refer to myself as a young person anymore. <laughs> you know, that yeah. point where you I sort have, of look and realize there's like generations I below have, me. <laughs> I, have sock, I have socks older than you, but anyway. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, I discovered Dallas Willard when I was young. Um, you've kind of looked a lot at his life. Um, do you think there'll be young people in 2080 reading mm -hmm. Dallas Willard? That is a good, that is a wonderful question, actually. Uh, I'm hoping your book helps with that. 
Uh, and the answer, the, the, the most honest answer is, I don't know. I don't think that's a slam dunk answer. That, like I, I want to say, well, of course they will. I think I think two things. I, th from my perspective, Dallas offered a much needed corrective to a form of evangelicalism that had left out the experiential aspect, experiencing God, mm -hmm. experiencing the Trinity to a large extent. It was bringing back the experiential, that's, that's my, my take, uh, and it was hugely needed. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I sometimes kind of recoil when people talk about the, the spiritual formation movement as being 40, 50 years old. It's like, are you kidding? <laughs> it's older than Jesus. I mean, yeah. like Moses was having a, I mean, Abraham, I should yeah. just go into, was having a spiritual formation moment standing over Isaac with a knife drawn. I mean, it doesn't, yeah. it, I mean, so, it, so it's not, it, but I know what they're talking about. Yeah. The, the w voices like Willard and Foster and many others and Jan Johnson, that it was these refreshing voices in, spoken into modern evangelicalism. So, if those voices get picked up all over the place, I'm not sure there's as much a, of a vacuum that says, yes, it's, it's Dallas. I mean, I mean, he might not be talked about in 60 years because he wins the day. Hmm. And it's not so unique anymore. It's not hmm. Uh, hmm. Uh, However, having said that, <clears throat> I believe this with all my heart, um, so we're writing the biography. I'm almost finished writing it. I'm on chapter whatever, nine or 10 and to hear about this conversation Dallas has with J.P. Moreland, where he says to J.P., here are the four critical concerns that have driven my entire life in ministry. When I heard those concerns, and I knew Dallas, I'd almost finished his biography, but when I heard those concerns, I thought, okay, I finally get it. Hmm. These are classic, and they won't ever go away. So his concerns, I think, will be talked about in 2,000 years from now, whether it be he will be the reference point to those concerns, I don't know. And in the saying as a psychologist and not a philosopher, so I can say it quickly, uh, you know, that he had a concern for a robust metaphysical realism. There is a mind independent reality that includes even invisible things like the Trinity and the Kingdom. And so he writes Divine Conspiracy. He had a concern for epistemic realism. This reality is not only the fountainhead of all reality, it can be a source of knowledge. Well, how does that happen? Well, he writes Spirit of the Discipline and Hearing God. Um, and then, concern for a complete anthropology. Don't leave out the invisible parts of the person. Renovation of the heart. Mm -hmm. And then finally, finally, and we might, we might slightly disagree on this, which is great, because I've, I've, been, wrong, I've been wrong before. Interesting. Uh, but I just don't recall it. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, that if, that if <laughs> you can refresh me, but that if, if, if you're doing those three things, you're talking about something that's even beyond faith. Uh, this is actual knowledge. Uh, and so I think those things hmm. will be talked about as long as Christianity's talked about. I don't know if Dallas will get credit for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, he picked up on some very classic themes in the Christian tradition and, right. and, and spoke about them in a way that was important for our time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. That's, that's the sort of the way in which you kind of start to transcend your own your own time is to sort of yeah. ride that that wave. And I don't think Dallas. I don't know what you're going to think about this one. This is off the. Uh, I'll be, be real brief, and it's. I need to shut up. Yep. But uh, no, maybe I need to shut up now. No, go, no, just, go, <laughs> go, do it. <laughs> but, what's that? Louder. Louder. You. I need to be louder. Okay. Okay. Um, well, no, I, 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 I'm a psychologist, so I'm careful about how I say this. I'm not saying that Dallas is like a Rorschach inkbot. I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. But I am saying that me, as a fan of the church of the first three centuries, I can read Dallas and I can see a lot of stuff. Oh, wow, this was when Christianity was so alive. He's saying similar things. And you, as a wonderful Reformed theologian, can see in... Calvin and Luther and some of the magisterial reformation things that he's also you know saying those things as well yeah. but but I need to ask you a question um, yes so what are things like in Europe because as I've I'm assuming Europe is 10 years ahead of California 20 years ahead of Georgia so you're getting there before the rest of us how, how are things in a 
post-Christian Europe for you and your ministry? With respect to Dallas Willard or? Uh, with respect to Dallas Willard and spiritual formation, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, uh, it's like <laughs> that, that uh, spiritual formation movement that started 40 or 50 years ago, like hasn't started there in Europe yet. <laughs> So we are um, in in the Protestant churches, but but it, in very similar ways in in the Roman Catholic churches, we are at a very um, very beginning place. Just um, basic, just explaining basic terms, kind of coming back to um, uh, coming back to. What what was it that Jesus was really after? And um, because a lot of European churches are just they just they're kind of doing what they always did, just sort of just on and on. Um, and so, and we have uh, difficulty when when we kind of people kind of know a spiritual growth is important and and discipleship is important, but they don't. Nobody has a plan. Nobody has a plan. You know, Dallas's curriculum for Christ like this. Nobody has anything approaching something like that. Like, well, this is how we'll do it then. Um, this is how we'll we'll grow in Christ. So that's that's really where where we are. And and so it's interesting for me to be there and having access to sort of what's happening in North America or at least in sort of English speaking countries and mm -hmm. and sort of seeing a lot of talk i mean the the number of people that you meet who have done spiritual direction training or are spiritual directors i mean that's a, right. a wealth which is growing here and it, it's changing a little bit in europe but it's just not anywhere anywhere near that right. i i feel sometimes like richard foster and dallas willard in the 1970s like you know, getting kicked out of churches because they want to talk about fasting or something like that. There's it's not a, that bad, but... It's a very special place to be, potentially. Yeah, but, mm. yeah, disappointing mm. and frustrating sometimes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, now, I know the story, but they, they don't. So how, how did you get into writing a biography of Dallas Willard? And not one of Freud. <laughs> oh well, that's interesting. That's interesting right there uh, because, as some people in this room know, um, Dallas Willard, one of his, you know, one of the most influential people in his life was uh, was Husserl. Uh, Husserl's major professor was Franz Brentano. Franz Brentano had two famous students, uh, Edmund mm -hmm. Husserl who went back to philosophy and became the father of phenomenology, and Sigmund Freud, who went back, to, who went to psychology and was saying, let me talk to you about some invisible real things in psychology. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that, that is an interesting connection. Uh, yeah. But uh, long story short, um, so uh, um, I just kept finding excuses to be in the same room with Dallas for about 20 years before in being invited to go and uh, uh, start the uh, Martin Institute Dallas Willard Center at Westmont, which was wonderful, and I still enjoy that work greatly. We weren't going to do a biography; we were going to do a documentary on Dallas, like a video so or yeah, audio or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. So that I'd, I'd been interviewing him for the purpose of a documentary. Yeah. But but when we started that, we didn't know he was going to die. Right. And so so when all that happened. I went to the family uh, and said, hey, we would like to sponsor somebody to write a biography on Dallas. And they have all these notes from the documentary stuff. And the family surprised me by saying, we'd like for you to do it. And that was one of the, one of the best two or three days of my life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, what, do you remember like some of the surprises from the biography? Like, oh, oh I didn't know that. Yeah, they're all kind of surprises. Like one is, why would anybody in their right mind claim that they could write something like that if they never had before? That was a surprise. <laughs> uh, when I, when I remember when you were in the middle of it. And I, oh, this was wonderful, like oh. sort of being kind of there with Gary. He's like, this is way harder than my PhD. 
uh, like three, <laughs> like three, three dissertations from me. Um, no, I remember, so once, once it's done, and um, Mimi Dixon is coming out with a biography of a book that's going to be on celebration of discipline. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and she was a perfect choice. And I finished the biography, and the publisher said, would you consider taking on this project? And I said, no, because I saw, as a kid, I saw this cartoon where Goofy is getting a job at the circus, and he tells the circus person he can, his act is to drink a gallon of gasoline and then swallow a match. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it, it, as, he's, his, as his soul, quote unquote, is floating up toward the top of the tent, um, the circus owner says, you have the job. He says, thank you, I can only do this once. <laughs> anyway, that's a long way to go. Um, um, that's probably enough. I forget the question, but so, it was surprises. I don't yeah, know. Maybe yeah. Dixon, oh, surprise, something like oh, that. The title, the title that uh, becoming Dallas Willard, that he wasn't. I only knew him. I, I'd known him for 20 years plus, but I only known him after age 50. Mm -hmm. A philosopher who spoke in precise definitions and had every, his act together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. He, the journey to becoming that person was probably the real story in some yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember when when we f when when it was finished, and um, so you and I were kind of like we'd find out little pieces about his his life, and uh, it kind of came in like like just segments, right? Yeah, and yeah. so it, over a process of years, and then you know it's published and people start reading it, and the number of comments. The sort of people like crying during the biography. Do you remember that by I reading do. it? It really was surprising. It was. Yeah. It really surprised us, and I think it was the the intensity of it, mm -hmm. the story, where we kind of got it over a series mm -hmm. of years, mm -hmm. but everybody else read it in a yeah. In a, yeah. Thank you, Mike. In a time. Yeah. I have a, one last question for you. Okay. So, what are some ways you're following following in Dallas's footsteps in Europe? Um, hmm, collecting books. Um, yeah, I've seen them. I'm trying to read them too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, I think we're 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 trying to engage people, find ways to engage people intellectually is something that. Uh, that Dallas had always done at USC, just finding ways to reach people through their minds. Um, and that is very often a very good access point to people. I mean, I know you can reach people through feelings and, and all that as well, but we are, uh, we're trying to be a knowledge institute, Sanctus, and so that's one thing that we're, that we're doing. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think, you see in Dallas's life a real heart for, for pastors. You know, he's got all these people that are in ministry in various ways. And actually, Gary's Gary's one. You know, Gary, and all, and and Anne as well, uh, and her husband Scott. You know, he just likes to come alongside these people who are in ministry and and uh, working and uh, and just help them thrive as as people. And that's something that we're. Uh, trying to do with European ministers um, to help them see a different way of life, a different way of thinking that um, is more sustainable and actually helps the people that they're trying to minister to. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Um, you have answered all of my questions. Have I answered your question? Um, I've, got, I've got more for you, but I think maybe we should uh, see if anybody else has some questions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if not, then I'll ask these, these other ones. What would Dallas say to ECO today about ministry in a post-Christendom, hmm. post-modern? I'm trying to think if he would say anything different today than he was saying before, whether anything's really, really changed. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I know we all kind of know this, um, but 
it's it's then sometimes very hard to put it into practice. It, Dallas talked about the ABCs of church growth. You probably heard this: you know, attendance, buildings, and cash, and that can be pretty important to Presbyterian sort of. And, and even if you've, your church has entered kind of a survival mode, that still sort of the, tend to be things that really capture our, our attention. And I um, think, yeah, Dallas would want to say, let's, let's try to focus our attention on something else, making, making disciples. Um, and even if we don't have attendance buildings and cash, we could still try to do that sort of thing. That if you really can offer someone the pathway to love and peace and joy, you don't have to worry about the ABCs. Yeah. To be able to beat the doors down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You first. Okay. There's this, am I right? There's a sense that Dallas Willard was controversial in his time, and maybe, you know, at my time at Gordon Conwell, he wasn't on the reading list necessarily, and your time at Fuller, he wasn't on the reading list. Was he too new? Fill us in on, hmm. or is there continuing resistance to Dallas in certain camps? Hmm. Um, and in Eco, he's kind of a hero. Uh, John Mark Comer, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a movement. Is it gaining steam? What do you, what do you see? Hmm. Uh... Yeah, I think I think one of the things that Dallas was people were maybe a little concerned about is he so he was a philosopher and he he really he said once that um, one of the things that he would would cause him to turn down an invitation is when the people would talk about all these other great people that were there that were going to be speaking and he said well you know maybe I should go somewhere else where there's not so many great people and that's where I'll speak. And, and one of the groups that he worked with in his lifetime was the now largely defunct emerging church group. And he was happy to sort of show up at their events yeah. and give to them and try to help them along. Um, and most of them were sort of in this idea of merging postmodernism and Christian faith. And if you know Dallas Willard's philosophy, you kind of know he doesn't do that. But he was very happy to sort of be there and, and to work with them. But then that, from a public standpoint, that looked like he's their, their theologian and then mm -hmm. other people kind of try to distance him from that. I remember there was, back in the 2000s, yeah. that was an issue. Yeah, when I think about the Dallas Willard Hater websites, it's, it's usually they're like in one of two categories. One is just his um, uh, Ecumenism, in a, in a positive sense, mm -hmm. that he's willing to talk across denominational lines and learn across the lines. And the other, I think, has to do with the experiential, that if people are put off by this experiential mm -hmm. w awareness of interacting with the Trinity, yeah, that can yeah. be a little threatening. But Yeah, yeah. Yeah, talking, talking to God, which generally yeah. eco-churches are okay with, but there are other churches that are sort of a little, little worried about, you know, God talks to us, and he talks through his word, and shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah, Lil, I think it was Lily Tomlin when had, Tomlin had a great quote for that, that if we, if we talk to God, it's prayer. If God talks back, it's schizophrenia. Yeah. No, but, that, but that's not what I believe, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. My question is kind of similar. So I've taught Willard stuff like... Um, Chapter 9 in Divine Conspiracy, the curriculum for Christ likeness, and a little bit of the, um, the VIM model in renovation of the heart in, in our large church in Houston. And I, I found that very few people connected with it and hmm. were into it, but many more sort of raised their eyebrow and either questioned it or didn't understand it. Hmm. And my question for you is when, when you have taught this in the church and you've seen pushback. Why is that? Aside from mm. what you've just said, this seems like a biblical theology 101 that we, the church has misunderstood for mm. decades. Mm. What has uh, been some of the things that you've seen? I hate, I hate to say this because it might kind of jinx it, but so now one of the most fun things that uh, Regina, the woman to whom I am married, 
Uh, we'll be celebrating the 50th anniversary of our first date on January the 14th, uh, February the 14th. Anyway, so we do a lot of either VIM retreats or retreats based on each of Willard's four critical concerns and with some very unlikely groups. I mean, like uh, holiness groups and holiness and Pentecostal groups and, 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 and on and on and on. We have never gotten significant pushback, but, 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 we're very careful about like language and definitions up front. So if, in other words, if it's a holiness group, I want to put spiritual formation in the context of the best definitions of, of, of holiness experience and pursuits. And if it's in a Pentecostal group, it's probably in the context of the experiential awareness of the invisible real that's here. But the main thing is, the main thing is when we do, when we do the VIM model, and to me, to me, I think, and I'll say this and be brief, I've been talking way too much tonight, um, that when there's a problem with the spiritual formation journey, I always look to, is, is there a problem with the vision? Is there, is, what is, does the person have a vision of God that is loving enough and magnificent enough? If not, let's start there, it's not gonna make any sense. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is, do you have a vision of yourself that is beloved enough? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, if not, you need to start there, and finally, do you have a view of salvation that is at least as much at home in a hospital as a courtroom? And when those three tumblers align, and for most people, light bulbs kind of go on because if they're really honest and it's an environment of just transparency, it's like, no, my view of God is not loving or magnificent enough. My view of myself is more self-loathing than being beloved. And my view of salvation actually is only at home in a courtroom. Uh, that's, it's kind of more the hook, I mean, you, the language and then the hook, uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I think the hook, the hook is, is there. You have to try to find the, the existential pain points that people are, are in. And that may be, you may have a church setting where those aren't very visible, <laughs> uh, but trying to find those and sort mm -hmm. of then then people are people who are really in need of change are really happy to hear about something like them or curriculum for Christ likeness. Yeah. But people yeah. who are quite happy with where things are right now might not be ready for that. Like Presbyterians yeah. sometimes. Like Presbyterians <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something else? Somebody else? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, so Vim is out of Dallas Willard's book, Renovation of the Heart. And he tries, he likes sometimes to make things really pithy so people remember them. And it's worked, so we, we remember it here. <laughs> v is vision, I is intention, and M is means. And so his idea is that these, these kind of go in order. Any kind of change, if you want, if you want to go from being a terrible piano player to a great piano player. First, you have to have a vision of why that would be good for you. And also, like, what is a piano? And how do you sit at one? And, and that intention is the decision, the sort of movement towards, sort of, I'm, I'm going to do this. I see that I can be better than Chopin or whatever you think. And then the means is like, well, I better find a piano teacher or something like yeah. that. That's it. Something else? Somebody else? Yeah. Are there any plans on perhaps pursuing the documentary that you had in mind? Uh, it's sort of happening. Um, uh, Avo Adurian, who uh, mm -hmm. just, if anything is uh, beautiful and functional at the Conversatio website of the Martin Institute, it's, it's mm -hmm. Avo. And if anything is a thorough collection, it's, it's Mike. But uh, Avo, um, uh, yes, he's there. Like six parts done out of I think it's going to be like ten or twelve parts. These little five to eight minutes where um, some of the interviews from it were pulled together. I think he's done a masterful job of mm -hmm. connecting them and tying them together. And yeah, so that yeah. that's kind of happening. It won't be that's good. happening. It's not terribly comprehensive, but it's a good start um, yeah. video. Gary is one of the people that are interviewed. Oh, that, I don't and, like uh, that part, but, I, really, that, but I, I like. I was yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have, I think there's 
room to do a really, really good audio documentary because we don't have a lot of video mm. of Dallas like mm. baking his, making his bacon or whatever you'd put in a documentary, but we, you like that. I did, yeah, <laughs> I can see it, I can hear the sizzle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we have lots of audio of him talking about his life and so you can put that together with interviews of people. Mm, um, it's it started. It kind of has it. That takes it takes a good bit of investment and money to kind of get particularly audio people on on board to do that. But if you know a good investor who wants to see that happen, let us know. I'm just glad to know it might be on your bucket list. It might be on my bucket I list. Yeah, so. yeah. I hope, so. I hope so. Just you. Do you know an investor? Um, <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. Okay. Somebody else? No? Okay. One, yeah. One more thing. Yeah. Would you, would you speak a bit more um, uh, to uh, Dallas Willard, the man? We know Dallas mm. Willard, the thinker. Yeah. But you had a relationship with him. You had a friendship with him. Um, I'll leave it at that. Paint us a picture. You didn't know him. Oh, um, um, they're just, you would have so many of these. I, I, I hardly know where to start, I, but the first thing that leaps to mind is uh, that with Dallas Willard, a lot of people that were close to him said that uh, spiritual formation with Dallas was caught more than taught. The words were brilliant, but it was actually being with them after the lecture when he's investing so much time in you, when he's going and doing a Renovar Institute with 40 students, and he's lecturing three times a day, and he still insists on spending 30 minutes with every one of them during that one week. Mm -hmm. Or when he walks around a retreat center with his hands behind his back, and you're asking, why do you do that? And he says, because I can't hurry when my hands are behind my back. Just these, just the... Just that it, mm-hmm. that it worked. I mean, John Ortberg likes to say that he was the type of person that you just can't gossip if you're in their presence. Mm-hmm. There's just no, there's nothing that's pulling that out of you, and he's mm-hmm. kind of ashamed to be thinking that. Just mm-hmm. that it was just his person, mm-hmm. that it that it actually worked in his life, and he wasn't always like that. Mm-hmm. He would occasionally would shoot stray cats and shoot out street lights, and mm-hmm. he could as a teenager, could cuss with most anybody and, and, yeah. and win some tobacco spitting contests. But I mean, mm-hmm. he, it, it, he became- He sounded like a Georgian to me. Well, Missouri, it's not too far away. <laughs> yeah. The states even look a lot alike. Because uh, okay, I was hoping to draw out some of that gossip. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's a man I met who, Dallas, um, has a youth pastor at a church that uh, Dallas was preaching for in in LA and and Dallas comes to him and says uh, you know why don't you come over to my house on on Saturday morning and we'll we'll, uh, we'll just we'll chat so he says that he gets a bunch of his friends and and so they all go and then they spend a little bit of the morning together and then as they're walking out Dallas says come alone next time <laughs> Wow. And, uh, and that was the beginning. This is really very rare wow. of Dallas sort of intentionally getting somebody and meeting with them every Sunday morning or Saturday morning uh, just to sort of talk about life, talk about God, what they're thinking about. This, is, this man, he left youth ministry. Um, he became, started working with schools. Um, but uh, he... Um, he, he he wasn't Dallas wasn't doing that because he thought he was going to be his protege or anything mm-hmm. like that. He just saw a guy that he could had help. And mm-hmm. one of the things afterwards, the guy says that he says what I really remember from Dallas were his hugs. Mm-hmm. I really remember his hugs. Mm-hmm. Did did you ever get a good hug from? I, I, from I, I'm Dallas? Not enough, but not yeah, enough. I can relate. I can oh, relate great. a little bit. Yeah. Great. Uh, who poured into Dallas? Um, that would um, you should jump in here but I mean that was one of the hardest things about writing the biography is like he was raised by a he was like in a different home almost every year of his childhood life but he had a wonderful 
older brother and, and uh, J.I. and a wonderful mm -hmm. sister-in-law, Bertha, and those were certainly two that did. There were many, many others, yeah, yeah. pastors along the way. And Some people we didn't really get to interview because they died mm. uh, before that was would have been important. There's a Presbyterian man, uh, I can't think of his name, Gary Smith, uh, if anybody's from L.A., uh, Dallas. Dallas worked with Gary Smith, um, and that would have been a man that, that would have um, been important to Dallas. Yeah. The philosophy professor at San Luis Obispo, that they, it was a student okay. at Dallas, but they had a very much a collegial relationship. Yeah, and, yeah, I forget his name. Traveled yeah. in Europe together. Yeah. yeah, right. All right, thank you. Back to Anne. Um, thank you. Thank you. Renovare in the U.S. Mm. to Europe to get the message of spiritual formation throughout Europe, not just Germany, not just England, but throughout Europe. And he is doing that in a relational way um, and also um, as a writer. And so would you like to tell us briefly yeah. about your, uh, your ministry with St. Yeah, so... Loudly. Loudly. Um, <laughs> so I, I tell people I do two things. I'm a writer and I am the director of Sanctus. Um, maybe a story about Sanctus. So there's a, a, a guy I've known for a good number of years, maybe at least 10 years, works in Berlin, church planter. And this is a guy, he said he was interested in discipleship. And I thought, oh, good. Uh, he wanted to do like a discipleship church, and I, um, but he kind of was loosely aware of me, and I don't know that I changed all that much, but one of the things that we were doing, we were just putting out these these videos that we, we do, and just finding, trying to find ways to connect with, with ministers in Europe who might be interested in spiritual formation, and and it took many years for this man to sort of realize this is really what I need and gradually is want looking at more of these videos and realizing wow yeah this this is this is a a way to live which I'm not quite aware of and and so it but it's taken years to sort of for him to kind of go through this process of being ready to sort of say okay I, I need something different and and those are the, so it's it's often a very very slow process. It's spiritual formation is not booming in Europe or anything like that. There's this is a this is a very slow slow ministry that we have, um, but we're trying to be very relational with people as well as kind of coming at people with with ideas. Um, and so that's where the writing comes in as well. Uh, you can read more about it on on the website and all of that, um, but. Uh, on the handout, you can go to uh, Sanctus Institute. You see the website. Um, that's kind of the formal definition uh, of, of what we're doing. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if there's a way that we can somehow partner with your church um, to help us, you know, we're looking actually to hire somebody now because my, my time is, is limited in what I can do. Um, but that's because in somebody Europe. in Europe, hire somebody in Europe, in Europe. Europe. Yeah. Um, but that's because somebody donated money and we're going to try to invest that money to sort of just expand what we, what we do. Well, we're thankful to both of you gentlemen for answering God's call on your life and mm -hmm. for the ways that God is using you uh, to spread uh, the gospel of the kingdom. So thank you mm -hmm. so, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.